This whole series is really foundational to everything. It's absolutely foundational. And the message that I'm going to give right now is the foundation of the foundation. This is the cornerstone. This is it. This is everything. So I want you to really be uh, uh, paying close attention to this. Uh, for some of you, this maybe will be at least partially review, but you can't review this stuff enough. For others, it's going to be really new uh, and um, maybe even scandalously new. So I just encourage you to hear me out and, uh, and keep an open mind and listen to this. I'll warn you ahead of time that I've been on kind of a manic drive lately. I got an hour and 45 minutes sleep last night. I've had a lot of coffee, so I'm kind of bouncing off the wall. So if I get a little bit weird, just you know, flow with me here. It'll be okay. But I'm just kind of like buzzed out on, on this. It's like I've been writing a lot. My, sometimes I just can't find the off button in my brain. And so it's like, where is that off button? And why I can't find it. And so you know, stay up and read and write. And so anyways... <laughs> Need a cup, one more cup of coffee. Bring it on. God, uh, God's love. We're, we're entitled this thing, is God is love. Uh, it really should be entitled God is scandalous love because we're going to be looking at the scandalousness of his love. God is scandalous love. I want to read, just to kind of prime the pump here, the same verse we read last week to prime the pump. It's one of the simplest but most profound verses in the entire Bible. 1 John chapter 4 says, Whoever does not love does not know God. It's pretty simple. It doesn't matter what they say. If you don't love, you don't know God. Because God is love. Last week we looked at uh, uh, several different words for love in Greek. We, we have one word that covers everything, which is why we get screwed up on this topic. But in Greek they've got four words. You've got storge, which is the word for affection. And then you've got... Uh, philos, which is the word for brotherly love or friendship. And then you've got eros, which is the word for passion. And then you've got agape, which is choice-based, other-oriented, self-sacrificial love. The kind of love that God is, is agape. Agape defines God's love. And what we showed last week is that agape love isn't simply a verb that God does. It's the noun that God is. It's the noun God eternally is. It's his nature. God is love. It's different than saying God loves. That's beautiful. But God is love. As Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God is eternally perfect, unsurpassable love. Which is why we showed last week that it is impossible, impossible for God to stop loving you because of something you've done. There's no off button there. Because for God to do that, he'd have to stop being God. Think about it. And so what you can know right now, this moment, is that God has a perfect, unsurpassable love for you. It's an other-oriented, self-sacrificial love towards you. Right now, you're the object of God's perfect love. There's nothing you're going to do that's going to improve that love. Now, maybe God doesn't storge everything about you, which means he doesn't necessarily approve of everything about you. In fact, I'm sure there's some things about all of us that he doesn't approve of, but it doesn't mean he doesn't agape love you. And you may not be a friend of God right now. I hope you are, but you may not be, because to be a friend of God means that you are in alignment with his will and, and you're cultivating a relationship, and maybe you're not there. So you don't have a philos kind of a love for him, but he still agape loves you. And maybe you're not passionate about God. Maybe you're passionately against God. I don't know. So there isn't that eros kind of relationship between you and God, but it doesn't stop God from having agape love for you. At all times, in all places, at every moment, God is for you, not against you. He's on your side. He, he, he wants the best for you now and throughout eternity. That's who he is. He's poured out towards you. The definition of that is the cross. That's what the cross is all about. And so to understand what agape love is, the Bible doesn't give us an abstract definition it points us to an event. The event is Calvary. So John says this in 1 John 3, 16. This is how we know what love is. It's not based on our feelings or warm fuzzy or our mood or circumstances. Ignore that. Here's what you know, how you know what love is. Agape love. Christ, Jesus Christ, laid down his life for us. There's the proof. God's attitude towards you every moment from the start is Calvary. Calvary like love. He believes that, deems that you were worth dying for, which means he ascribes to you an unsurpassable worth. You, you couldn't be worth more, as evidenced by the fact that he paid an unsurpassable price for you and for every other human being that exists. That's agape love. 
What I want us to see today is why that love, that agape love, that Calvary-looking love is scandalous. If we don't see that it's scandalous, we're not getting it. It's got this scandalous dimension to it, which is why we entitled this whole series, Scandalous Love. Uh, to get at that, I want to read a passage from 1 Corinthians where Paul talks about the scandal of the cross. And we'll unpack this a little bit. Uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, he says, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. It's a stumbling block, and there's the word scandal on A stumbling block to Jews and it's foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Pray with me here for a moment. Father, I thank you for every person in this auditorium and every person listening, listening through podcast or television or some other means. And God, my prayer is that for every one of us that we would hear about your love for the first time, as though it was for the first time. God, free us from ever getting used to this, ever uh, just uh, making it into a mediocre, normal sort of a thing. Open our eyes and ears to see and to hear this word as though for the first time. And God, we pray that you would, by the power of your Spirit, infuse this word and use it to drive out of our brains every single thought that doesn't agree with Calvary, every single, single picture of you that doesn't agree with Calvary. Empower us to do what we can't do on our own, and that is to believe that this is true. You really are this beautiful and infinitely beyond that. The good news is far better than we could possibly imagine. Help us to believe it, to receive it, and to be transformed by it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let me start by just drawing attention to this magnificent painting. A friend of mine, Daniel Bonnell, um, uh, painted this, this work. He's an he's a artist. He's fairly well known. He's been in uh, some works on Christian art. Um, and he's a podrichener. Everyone say hi to Danielle. Say hi. Hi, Daniel. Isn't that a great work of art? It's incredible. He, um, it's, it's, it's outstanding. It's absolutely outstanding. He sometimes is inspired. He's a podrichener, and he, he's, he's uh, sometimes inspired by some of the messages here. And uh, several years ago, we had a whole series called A Beautiful Mess and inspired this painting, and so this painting's called A Beautiful Mess. If you Google his name, you can find his gallery online and stuff. It's just, I, I love the kind of Van Gogh quality of this. It's kind of like a starry, starry night feel to it. In fact, a lot of his works have that. They, 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 when, when you look at them, it's almost like the, the thing moves. And every time I look at it, I see something a little different. There's a lot of movement here. And see, here's what this captures. Uh, this is what God is like. This, this is the heart of God right here. That's what, if we get it, we'll see how, why it's a scandal. God reveals himself most clearly and unambiguously when he becomes a human being and goes to Calvary and enters into our hell and enters into our sin. It's, and, and it's kind of ironic, but God is most clearly revealed to be who he is when he becomes other than he is. The all-holy God takes on our sin and our condemnation and dives into our hell, and that's where we see God in, as he really is because that's where we see the beauty of God, the unsurpassable, incomprehensible beauty of God. He dives into our mess. God is most revealed to be himself when he's diving into our mess, our hell. And this picture just captures that magnificently. What I really love about this is like a window into the heart of God. I, I, I maybe am reading too much into it, I don't know. My wife says I read too much into everything. I, I, every, every movie, it's you know, a theology movie, and sometimes she's saying, Greg, it's just a movie! So maybe I'm, I'm overreading this, but as I see it, it's like, here's God the Father. You know, the Son represents God the Father being poured out, his love is being poured out on Calvary, and Jesus is on the cross. And the swirls around him, uh, to me, sort of represent the Holy Spirit. It also represents kind of the mess that we're diving into and how God just gets all involved in the mess that we're, that we're about. But, but we have the whole triune God here, the Trinity here, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the reason why I think that that's so profoundly magnificent is because the cross really is our window into the heart of God. See, God is love. Right? He's agape love. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Perfect, unimprovable, delightful, joyful, ecstatic love throughout all eternity. And when God reveals that to us, here's what it looks like. 
God's been doing this within himself in some way, shape, or fashion throughout eternity, and now he turns it towards us to invite us in on this dance, and here's what it looks like. It's got this dance. God is just being God as he reveals himself to us, and it turns out he's on Calvary, dying a hellish death for a race of people who could deserve it less. That's the heart of God. And if we get that, we'll see why it's scandalous. Because it confronts everything our natural fallen brain would ordinarily think about God. I'll come back to this picture at the end of this message. But I want to talk here now about scandal. What is a scandal? The word that Paul uses is scandalon. And it refers to an obstacle or something that's an offense or a stumbling block. A scandalon is something that shocks us. Maybe it makes us indignant, angry, or we find it unbelievable. That's a scandal on. Now, today, we use the word scandal in a little bit of a different sense. Usually, a scandal is something that's kind of scintillating. Uh, it's got like an entertainment quality to it, an amusement factor to it. Oh, it's just scandalous. This is what sells tabloids. You know, th there's always these scandals. Uh, you know, people, for reasons I don't quite get, but they really get into celebrities when they have these scandals. It's like we live, our lives are uninteresting, but their lives are interesting because there's always you know, scandals going on there. So, so you, you read about, oh, there's Jennifer Aniston. Uh, Aniston. A Aniston? Aniston? Jennifer somebody. And, and, and the, the word on the street, folks, I just saw it the other day in a tabloid, uh, that um, uh, uh, Brad Pitt's having trouble with Angela Jolie, I guess, who would have thought. And, and so uh, they're, they're like starting to, you know, get back together again. Why she'd want to get back together with him, nobody can figure out. But there you are. It's a scandal. Ooh. And then Sandra Bullock, poor Sandra Bullock, she's such a sweet lady, at least in the movies and stuff. And then there's this guy, what's his name, Jesse James, who was their husband, and it cheated on him, and, or her, I mean, and uh, uh, oh, it's just a mess, so apparently she's divorcing him. And There's always these kind of things, Tiger Woods, you know, that whole thing. And it's kind of scintillating, you know, that's why people buy this stuff. And then there's the politicians that keep our life interesting by providing a regular diet of scandals for us, scintillating stuff. There's Mark Sanford who got involved with the lady down in Argentina. He's the governor of South Carolina and then held the single worst press conference ever held in the history of humanity. As he kept on talking and talking and talking about how wonderful this person in Argentina is and how they're soulmates. And it's like, dude, shut up. You're going, you know, this isn't helping you at all. He just kept on talking. His wife's there grabbing for a knife. I don't know, but it's a scandal, scandal. And then, and then you've got John Edwards. God bless John Edwards. God bless Mrs. Edwards. Uh, or no, I don't know what her last name is now, but she, I, she was divorcing him because this is the presidential candidate, and while he's running for the presidential candidate and his wife's got breast cancer, he gets involved with this lady who's doing some kind of video thing, and then they, she gets pregnant and they have a, a child, but he covers it up with, with, with uh, you know, a lot of money. And I, I, How do you have time for that when you're running for president? That's like, you know, that, that's amazing. I, he's got to get kudos for that, but it's a scandal. I mean, that's something. I, I you hear about that. How, how could that be on your mind? When, and then there's Elliot Spitzer. God bless Elliot Spitzer. Uh, he is the guy who really kind of made a name for himself, cracking down on prostitution and pornography. And then it turns out he has a little bit of that going on in his own life. And it's just scandals. And it's scintillating and kind of entertaining, amusing. And people, you know, kind of just find that something worth reading about. That's not at all what Paul means when he's talking about the scandal of the cross. There's nothing entertaining about this. It's not supposed to be scintillating or amusing or anything like that. The scandal on of the cross is something that is to offend us, make us indignant. It evokes part of our fallen brain goes, no way, impossible. It forces us to make a decision as to what we're going to believe. In fact, as we said last week, we, we, on our own power, we can't believe this. It is too good to be true. It's too beautiful to be true. Our brains won't allow ourselves to, to, to believe it. That's why Paul prays, and we, we just sang about this a minute ago, Paul prays in Ephesians 3, you know, that we would have the power, because ordinarily we're just too weak, he prays that we would have the power to understand with all uh, the saints what is the height and the depth and the width and the breadth of the love of God that passes all knowledge. That we would know that we can't know it. Now you're beginning to know it. Um, and, and, but we can't do that on our own. He prays that we'd have the power to do that. It confronts us with a scandal. This is a scandal that God would look like this. It was a scandal to both the Jews and the Greeks in the first century, Paul says. It was a scandal to the Greeks because they were into wisdom. And in their wisdom, they had constructed kind of a view of God, philosophical view of God, where God is, 
is too transcendent to ever be involved in human affairs, and God's too transcendent to be ever changed or have emotions or have passions. And God, you know, it's kind of in some circles with the Greeks, uh, this all controlling God, and He's free from all sorts of emotion or whatever. But see, Jesus doesn't define God that way. The Greeks, in their wisdom, define God in terms of His otherness. His transcendence, his power, his control, his freedom from emotion and suffering. But Jesus defines God's greatness in terms of his love. And it's the kind of love that never stays distant and never stays aloof. It's willing to to dive into our mess, dive into our emotions, and suffer profoundly for the sake of the beloved. That's God's greatness as Jesus defines it. God became a human being and died on the cross. But to the Greeks who do their own sort of theology with their own wisdom, it's it's an offense. That looks like a weak God, a foolish God. Why would God ever do that? And the Jews had their own scandal on. They were scandalized by the claim that God would become a human and die on a cross because they viewed God in terms of power and, and, and their nationalism. God was great because he's on our side. The mighty Jehovah was going to fight our battles and liberate us from the Romans. And and the Messiah was supposed to come down and confirm all of that. And that's the sign they were looking for. They wanted this powerful God. But instead, Jesus comes down and he doesn't define God's greatness in terms of nationalism or anything of the sort. He defines God's greatness in terms of his scandalous love. He's a God who's so loving he doesn't favor one nation over another. That was a scandal to them. He doesn't favor your, your ideals over their ideals or love you more than their enemies. His love is so great, it's for the good and the evil, the righteous and the unrighteous, those who are on your side and those who are against you. And that was scandalous to them. They really believed they had God kind of in his box. He's on our side. Jesus is a scandal. They thought this view of the Messiah was just weak. What kind of Messiah? The Messiah is supposed to come and beat up our enemies, not get crucified by them. For crying out loud. So this is a weak God. A foolish God. The cross is a scandal. If we understand what it's about, it's a scandal. The trouble is that even today, we have ways of avoiding this scandal. Christians have ways, built-in ways, of avoiding this scandal. This is supposed to confront all of our conceptions of God. All the things we would normally with our natural fallen limited minds think that God is like. It's supposed to confront that, scandalize us, offend us. But see what can happen, and this happens a lot throughout church history, it happens a lot today, is is we don't let it be a scandal. And the way that we do it is not by rejecting Jesus as the Messiah like the, 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 the Jews of the first century, many of the Jews of the first century did and like the Greeks did. What we do is we, we, we take away its scandal by, by sort of integrating it with everything else. It, it, it's, we, we don't allow it to tell the whole story. It tells part of the story. It's much less scandalous if you do that. Yeah, God is love. God's love dies for us in Calvary. Yes, but. We always have those buts in our head that we talked about last week. Yes, but. That's only part of the story. We have to balance that love with God's holiness and justice. As though God's holiness and justice was something other than his love. You see, we're misunderstanding holiness and justice if we're playing it off against God's love. If God is love, then everything God has, including his holiness and justice, is a manifestation of that love. But what we do is we just sort of like, well, yes, he, yes, Calvary for sure, but, but, but we have to integrate that with, well, let's remember, you know, God has kind of a nasty streak. He slaughtered the Canaanites. He sent the flood. He incinerated Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, you know, uh, he, 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 he breathes down fire from heaven once in a while and, and, and incinerates people. He killed the firstborn uh, Egyptian child. So yes, he's Calvary, but we have to balance that now with all this other stuff. And probably right now, a lot of you, whether you're watching me in this auditorium or listening through podcasts, you're going, well, yeah, isn't that what you're supposed to do? And I'm saying here this morning, no, that's not what we're supposed to do. What happens is that we end up with a schizophrenic God. A God who's got two antithetical, opposite kind of sets of attributes. Yes, loving, but then at the same time, you know, he might just predestine us to be burning forever and ever for his own glory. Well, how do those two things fit together? Well, it's a mystery. Yeah, God's loving, but you know what? You know, and he dives into our mess. But then again, we've got to remember, he's the one who creates the mess, right? He's the one who sends the disease and the earthquakes and the famines and has our kid get killed by a child because, well, his ways are not our ways and blah, 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 blah. And so we've got this, 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 this construction in our head where we sort of cram together everything we think we're supposed to believe about God. And that invariably, that yes, but theology, yes, Jesus, but, that yes, but theology screws us up. It screws up our relationship with God. How could it not? 
Of our relationship with God is, is, is the quality of our relationship with God is going to be totally dependent on what our, what our image of God is. And if we've got a yes, but God, a God with these two opposite kind of things, well, you know, he loves me, but then again, he might predestine that I, I or maybe my baby are going to burn forever. Hmm. Well, that's going to affect my passion for him, my love for him. Instead of having this exuberant, unqualified, trusting, loving relationship with him, there's going to be part of us. You see this throughout history in the, in, in the church's, some of its central theology. Yes, love, but man, there's a kind of paranoid streak there. Usually it gets panned out as sort of like, I, I, love, I love Jesus, but God the Father, I'm not so sure about. Now, Jesus is a good God. Uh, God the Father, well, Jesus protects me from the bad God. It gets spun all like that. And that's going to affect your relationship with him. Instead of having this exuberant joy, there's going to be this anxiety. Instead of dancing in this, this, this grace, we're going to have this kind of performance anxiety which so many Christians are afflicted with. It undermines and erodes our passion and joy for God. And for a lot of people, it just becomes so unbelievable that they just give up on it. We've got yes, but in our brain. Yes, Jesus is, God is, it looks like Jesus, but he also has this nasty streak, yada, yada, yada. And as I said last week, how desperately we need to kick the butt out of our brain. Amen? We need to kick the butt out of our brain. Just get rid of those things. If we're going to really have the kind of relationship with God that God wants us to have in Jesus Christ. So what I want to do right now, this, see, the cross has got to scandalize every part of our brain that has a picture of God that is sub-Christian or anti-Christian, anti-Christ-like. So I'm going to now go through a, a very intense 20 minutes. Yes, 20 minutes. 18 minutes, maybe. Uh, it's going to be very intense. The most intense you've ever heard it here, okay? Uh, and and we're gonna, I'm going to deluge you with a bunch of scripture because I know that right now a lot of you are saying, prove it. Well, I'm going to prove it. You're saying, oh, come on now. I thought we are supposed to combine new and Old Testament. Uh, and so I, I, I'm going to deluge you intensely with a, a, a bunch of scripture. Uh, I encourage you to take notes, but if you can't write this fast, and you probably can't. Uh, I encourage you to listen to this sermon two or three more times. Also, the scriptures I'm giving here, I, I, we, we printed out a handout. You can pick it up at the, uh, 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 the, the hub on the way out, although I'm not sure there's any left, but hopefully there are. Um, so, so pay close attention to this. This is, I believe, the most important teaching in the Bible. It's also one of the most neglected teachings of the Bible. So Holy Spirit, give us an open mind. I'm going to go through, very quickly, four biblical facts, or four biblical sets of facts that show us, prove to us, that we are not to combine Jesus with anything else. Jesus is to be the whole story, not part of the story. Which is to say Jesus is supposed to be a scandal. A scan this is why he's such a scandal uh, to folks. He's the whole story. So, fact number one, Jesus is the singular word of God, singular image of God, singular form of God, as well as the singular way, truth, and life. Hallelujah. That should prove it right there. He's not one of the ways, he's the way. He's not one of the truths. If you want to know the truth about God, Jesus isn't one of the truths, he's the truth. If you want to get life from God, he's not one of the ways, he is the way, he is the life. The whole idea of word of God means to express God's expression. And Jesus isn't one of a number of expressions of God, he's the singular expression of God. Not one of the images, but the singular image. Jesus is it. You want to know what God looks like, look, like, look at Jesus Christ. Fact number two. Oh, I love this passage. Listen to this. In Christ, Paul just packs it in here. In Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Mm. Let me break this down. In Christ, all the fullness dwells. In Christ, all the fullness dwells. In Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells. It's like Paul is, is, is piling superlative upon superlative. In Christ, all the fullness dwells. All means not some. The word is pan. It means all. So it's not like some of God dwelt in Christ. No, all of Christ. All of God dwelt in Christ. But it was all the fullness. Pleroma. It wasn't all of some aspect of God dwelt in Christ. All of one attribute of God dwelt in Christ. All of one side of God dwelt in Christ. No, all the fullness of God dwelt in Christ. And then he says it's all the fullness of deity. Tes, tes theotetos. That, that means not angel-like or divine-like or semi-god-like or something of the sort. It means the divinity of God, all that makes God, God. So Paul is saying this, all of the fullness of what makes God, God, dwelt in Christ in bodily form. He couldn't have said it more emphatically. 
So if you want to know what God is like, you look to Jesus. If you want to know what all of God is like, you look to Jesus. If you want to know what all the fullness of God is like, you look to Jesus. If you want to know what makes God God, you look to Jesus. And that can't be said about any other thing. In him is found the fullness of deity, which leads to a third fact. Jesus is the visible face of God. Holy Spirit, keep us attentive and ingesting this and chewing on this. Jesus, at one point Philip says to Jesus, Hey, Jesus, you've been talking about the Father. Why don't you show us the Father? The picture's worth a thousand words, right? You've been talking a lot. Why don't you just show us? And Jesus says, Philip, have I been so long with you and yet you don't know moi? If you see me, you see the Father. Why then are you asking, show us the Father? Whoa, 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 whoa. Look at me, he's saying. You want to know what God looks like? Here I am. Don't look. And he's saying, why then are you looking for the Father? Searching over here, searching over there. If you want to know what God looks like, keep your eyes fixed on me. Don't look to the left, don't look to the right, don't look above me or below me or in front of me or behind me. Look, your, look at me, as Scripture says over and over again. Fix your eyes upon Jesus. Amen. This is what God looks like. There, end of discussion. When you see Jesus, you're seeing the heart of the Father. When Jesus dies on the cross, you're seeing the heart of the Father. When Jesus serves the poor, you're seeing the heart of the Father. When Jesus tears down racial walls, you're seeing the heart of the Father. When Jesus tears down the sexual stereotypical walls and the social economic walls, when he lives that life and dies this death, death, you're seeing the heart of the Father. John says the same thing. First John, he says, No one who denies the Son has the Father. On the other hand, whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Look at that. If you've got Jesus, well, you've got all the God that you need to get. There's no extra father floating around out there. If you've got the son, you have the father. So don't go looking, suspecting that this is only part of the story, but maybe, oh, we can find more about God over here or over there. No, Jesus is the full revelation. So Paul says, we see the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. If you want to know what God looks like, you look at, at the face of Jesus. Here we see the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. When you look at the loving face of Jesus, you see the glory of God display, and that can't be said about any other person or any other text or any other book or any other anything. And it's scandalously beautiful. It's singularity. It's scandalously beautiful. But now we come to the most scandalous part. This is the most scandalous part right here. You ready for it? Do you want it? You want the truth? Can you handle the truth? Okay, here it goes. Here it goes. Number four, Jesus trumps all previous revelations. How important this is. Look, at the Bible is inspired. The whole Bible is inspired. I believe that to the core of my being. The divine inspiration of the entire Bible. Yes. But not every verse of the Bible has equal authority for all, throughout all time. It's weighted differently. So, for example, Jesus says, look at this passage here. He says, I have a testimony that's weightier than that of John. He's referring to John the Baptist. John is inspired. He spoke inspired words. But... Jesus' testimony is weightier. Apparently not, not all sayings are, have the same kind of authority throughout all the time. Jesus' is trumps John's. What's really interesting is that elsewhere Jesus says that John is the greatest of all the prophets that has ever been. All of the prophets leading up to him, of all those, John was the greatest, and yet Jesus says, my testimony trumps John. Do the math. If Jesus' testimony trumps John, well, then it trumps all the prophets leading up to Jesus. Jesus trumps all previous revelations. That was a scandal to the Jews. And it's still one of the main problems for Christians today, which is why our picture of God gets polluted and, and, and qualified. It, it is so clearly taught in other passages of Scripture. For example, I love this passage in Hebrews. Oh, this is so important. Holy Spirit, help us to uh, hear this and ingest it. In the past, the author says... Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets, and many times and in various ways. It's all good. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. The connotation is there now by his very own son. It's not mediated through, through the various things. Here, God himself and his son comes to us, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. So here, the one... That everything is for and everything is by. He's the purpose of everything. Now he himself is going to show us what God is like. Now listen to this. The Son, singular, the Son, there's only one, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation. The word there is in Greek, character. We get the word character from it. You may have inferred that. 
He's the character of God. He's the exact representation, the exact character of his being. And the word there is hypostasis, which means essence. He sustains all things by his powerful word. Okay, so here, here, here's what the passage is saying. If you want to know the character of God, not an approximation, but the exact character of God, look to Jesus. The writings in the past had a lot of good roles to play, and, and we can talk about what, what God was up to there. That's fine and wonderful. But they don't give us an unambiguous, clear revelation of God's character. If you want to know what God's character is, you look to Jesus Christ. That's what the passage is saying. And if you want to know the character of God's essence, hypostasis, you'll only find it in the Son, who is the radiance of the Father's glory. Here we get the heart of God. No, in the past, maybe we got some of God's plans and agendas and accommodations and, and, and things that he had to do and, and blah, 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 blah. We can talk about that. But only in Jesus Christ do we get the, the, the absolute essence of God, that God is love. God is Calvary-looking love. Only in Christ do you see that. Here we have the true character. Here we have the true essence of the Father. The Son, Jesus alone is the one and only Son. Jesus alone is the one and only uh, radiance of the Father's glory. Jesus alone is the one true, unambiguous expression of the Father's character. Jesus alone is the one who reveals God's very essence. Which is why Jesus says this. Oh, listen to this one. Matthew chapter 11. I, I came upon this about a year ago, and I've, it's just been blowing me away ever since. Jesus says this, All things have been committed to be by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. <laughs> no one! No one Kind of rules out everyone, I'm thinking. No one knows, okay, wait, no one knows the Father except you, Jesus? First of all, just kind of note how, 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 how presumptuous that is. If this was just a normal human teacher, I mean, he's crazy. No one except me knows the Father. But if he's the Son of God, he's telling the truth. And I think he is. But he says, no one knows the Father except me and then whoever I want to reveal. That would, no one would include all the people who wrote the Old Testament. Now, now, Jesus clearly believes that's divinely inspired, so maybe there's some like hyperbole going on here, some exaggeration, but at the very least, Jesus is saying, the revelation that you're getting from me as I'm going to Calvary, that revelation so trumps and dwarfs everything that came up to it beforehand that it's as though they didn't know a thing about God. You're only going to get it in me. And then those who I reveal him to. John says basically the same thing. It's a wild, wild thing that, that, that people very, very rarely get. Um, John chapter 1, look at this. He says, For law, the law has come through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. There's a contrast there. No one has ever seen God, but, here's the but we should get into our head, but the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is in closest relationship with the Father, he has made him known. Now, the, the, the contrast here is between, uh, you know, what came through the law, what came through the law, and they didn't see God, but then Jesus Christ comes in grace and truth, and now we do. And most scholars agree that the, 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 the connotation here is this. Only in Christ do we really get a true knowledge of God. Only when you understand the grace and truth do you really see God's true character. The law, it did some things that are important, but we didn't get the true character of God there. Jesus trumps all previous revelations, which is why. Which is why. Jesus sometimes even repudiates aspects of the Old Testament. Follow this. Jesus, for example, said, you've heard it said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. And the, his audience is all going, yeah, yeah, we read that. It's three times in the Old Testament. It's taught right there. Command it. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, Jesus says, do not resist an evil person. Don't retaliate is the meaning of that. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that, that you may be, that you may be, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Now, li listen to this. The eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, uh, lex talionis it's called, the, the quid pro quo, you know, tit for tat sort of mindset. It's at the foundation of the Old Testament law, that justice thing. It's at the foundation, and yet Jesus comes along and says, okay, that was, that was okay back then, but now we have a revised plan. Here's the deal now. You love your enemies. You bless those who persecute you. Who does this guy think he is? I mean, if, 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 if he is simply a human being, uh, you know, qualifying God's, God's law, well, then that would be blasphemy. 
Well, what he's in essence saying is, he's really saying, look, I'm, I'm Yahweh who wrote that law in the Old Testament, so I reserve the right to change it, and I'm changing it. And now the deal is this, you love your enemies, uh, and you bless those who persecute you. When you look at the Old Testament, you at times find Yahweh being portrayed in ways where he, he follow this, he commands people to show no mercy and slaughter people. Right? Deuteronomy. And yet here, Jesus is saying that that sort of behavior would disqualify you from being a child of God. Something has changed. You can only be a child of God if you're willing to love and bless your enemies. They didn't do that back then. So by those standards, they wouldn't even be children of God, as Jesus is teaching you now. Something seriously has changed here. And you can see why it would be so so inappropriate to take that old stuff, however you want to explain it, and now combine it with the revelation that we have in Christ. There's a time where Jesus sends out his disciples into Samaria, and they went preaching the gospel. A lot of the Samarian towns didn't like the gospel, so they rejected uh, the, the, the disciples. So the disciples come back, and they're ticked off. So they go to Jesus in Luke chapter 9. and says, And his disciples, James and John, said to Jesus, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's do the fireworks here. Let's use that divine power. And, and, and what's going on here is these guys are a bunch of racists. They didn't like the, 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 the uh, Samaritans. There's big racial animosity there. So they want to see some kaboom going on now. Jesus turned to them and rebuked them. And according to many early uh, manuscripts, he says, you don't know what kind of spirit you are of. Now, this is just wild. Listen to this. Because what the disciples were asking for that little fireworks display, they had precedent for in the Old Testament. Elisha did that in Samaria. That's what they're thinking of. Twice he had fire come down from heaven and incinerate people. So these people are saying, hey, the word of God says we have precedent for calling down fire from heaven and incinerating people. And yet Jesus says, knock it off. He rebukes them. He's mad at them. And he says, You're not, we're not of the same spirit. Which means that you know, Elisha was kind of a hero in the Old Testament. But a hero in the Old Testament would be rebuked by Jesus in the New. In fact, the hero in the Old Testament wouldn't even be considered a child of God in the New because he didn't love his enemies. Something significant has happened here. And however you want to explain that, the last thing we should ever do is take that and combine it with this, this portrait of God. When you read the Old Testament, I mean, there's some disturbing stuff that goes on back then. And one of the things you see is that God sometimes looks like a fire-breathing dragon. And breathes fire out on people. But now we learn that God's not at all like that. God's not at all like that. He's a God who would rather suffer at the hands of his enemies, out of love for his enemies, than he would be a God who incinerates them. It's a little bit like this. When you read the Old Testament, follow this. You get the impression, don't you? If you're a reader of the Old Testament, you get the impression over and over again that the way to be rightly related to God is to keep the law. Right? Meticulously keep the law and you're going to be okay. And, and it looks like God gave the law for that purpose. Here's how we're going to be rightly related. You keep that. When we get to the New Testament and God's real heart is put on display and the real God shows up here, well, we get a totally different impression about the law. Paul says that the reason, we now learn that we can't be right with God on the basis of the law. You can't law your way into a right relationship with God. And in fact, that's why he gave it. Paul says the law was given to increase sin, to drive us to the cross. It was all one big negative object lesson, to drive us to the cross. And all that violence and stuff, all of that was wrapped up with the law, the whole covenant that he had with people at that time. When Jesus comes, there's a radical reframing going on. And all that just goes to show this, and I, I, I end with this. Jesus has got to be our total picture of God. God is agape love, Calvary-looking love. He's not sometimes loving and sometimes not. He's not partially loving, but partially not. He's not loving on good days, but when he has a bad day, he's not. No, he's always loving because he is love. That's, his, that, that's the noun that he eternally is. And that love is most clearly expressed on Calvary. To go back to this painting, this is the total story about God. This is, this is the heart of God. This is, this is the dance of the Trinity throughout eternity. This is what God looks like when he displays himself to us. All of the fullness, all the fullness, all the fullness of deity, everything that makes God God is right here. This beauty, this scandalous beauty. And there can be no ifs, ands, or buts next to this. 
Now, we maybe have to do some talking about why there is this other stuff. Fine. But whether you can get an explanation or not, lock this in. If you see me, you see the Father. He's altogether good, altogether beautiful. And let this, we've got to let this scandalize all the other pictures that we have in our brain. However they got there. Let it scandalize and confront and tear down all of those other pictures that are in our brain. If there's a butt in our head, we need to kick it out. Now, uh, here's the thing. This takes, for, for a lot of folks who have just been used to always combining Jesus with a bunch of other stuff, it's going to take some time to move into this. So, on May 11th, we're having a question and answer time. Come with your questions about this. Uh, I'll do a little teaching. I'm working right now working on a book called Jesus vs. Jehovah, question mark. And, and wrestling with, with, you know, why there's these contradictory pictures of, of God in the Bible. And I'll, I'll share a little of that, and then we'll have a Q&A time. So you might want to take advantage of that. Out in the back, we've got the verses I just went through. I encourage you to, to get that and to chew on those. You might want to download the sermon and listen to it a couple more times to, to, to let it get in. We've got homework back there um, that I encourage you to pick up to help you digest more of this stuff uh, throughout the week. On, on the bridge, the internet bridge that we have, Wilton Hills Bridge, uh, uh, Scott is writing up a prayer journal or uh, uh, these devotions that I encourage you to, to take to heart and, and to chew on. We've got prayer journals back there. You can buy them for three bucks, but you don't have three bucks. Take them anyways, because other people donated money so you could do that. And, and we want people to be praying through this. Uh, 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 one, one thing you might check out is, uh, I wrote a book called Seeing is Believing that talks about uh, getting a picture of God that looks like Jesus and how that can affect our prayer life. A lot of different things here. What has to happen is we have to take captive every thought to Jesus Christ. Every thought, not to that verse or this verse or what you were taught back then or what some song said. No, take a captive to Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ looks like this. This is the heart of God. This is the heart of God. No buts. I'm going to pray, and as I do so, to seal this message in our hearts, I'm going to ask the prayer team to come forward. And if you're here and have any need whatsoever that you'd like to have prayed for, I encourage you to come forward and pray with these folks. Or if you just want to pray on your own, or if you just want to kind of admire this painting, uh, feel free to do that. Although I encourage you to uh, be respectful of the people who are praying. Also, we're going to have a, a, a copy of this up on the Bridge uh, website so, uh, or on Facebook, and you can check it out there. Father, help us to be scandalized, to let you be the scandalous, loving, outrageously beautiful God that you are. Oh, God, help us to, by the power of your Spirit, depollute our brains and hearts from every suspicion that maybe you're not that beautiful. God, help us to see that holding on to the butts uh, God, it, it's insulting to, to, to Jesus because he's the one who tells us no one knows the Father except him. Father, help us to put all of our eggs in that basket and have our focus exclusively on Jesus Christ to be scandalized and radicalized and transformed and metamorphosized by that love as it invades us and turns us upside down and causes us to sing when we, when I, we otherwise might be despairing, causes us to dance when we otherwise might be laying down, causes us to be courageous when we might otherwise become fearful. God, invade us with that love, that perfect love, that outlandish love, that scandalous love. Turn us upside down in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Go out and love on the world.